Welcome to our webinar tonight, Treatment of Pain, Opioid Choices and Issues for the Patient and Practitioner. Our speakers this evening are Dr. Greg Calder and Dr. Tracy Offerdahl. Dr. Offerdahl is attended at Temple University School of Pharmacy in Philadelphia for her undergrad and graduate degree. And she completed a residency at Temple University as well, where she spent time in internal medicine and infectious diseases. She's currently on faculty at Salish University as a part of optometry, where she's a course instructor there. She is earning uh, other degrees in holistic medicine, as well as certification in veterinary pharmacology. And she uh, has lectured to the optometric community extensively. She's frequently on our, our programs, and we're very happy to have her with, her with us tonight. And also Dr. Greg Calder graduated Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also did his residency there. He works in Duncansville in Johnstown, Pennsylvania as an ocular disease consultant. He has been involved in numerous FDA clinical investigations, lecturing extensively throughout the United States uh, and other nations as well. He has been very active politically, very supportive of organized optometry and, and served as a trustee of the AOA board for 2013 and 2016. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Greg and Tracy. Thanks, Joe. And uh, we'll just get started here. As always, we need to do disclosures. And uh, the content of this activity was prepared independently by me and Tracy for this one. Um, you can see my list of people I've lectured for and received uh, honorarium. Really not too much in an opioid lecture here that really needs to be, in a sense, financially disclosed. But there's all um, PA medical director for Involve. Uh, I sit as a chairman of the advisory council for healthcare registries. And really, there's nothing that really financially supported in here. You can see the companies above and the content and the format has been presented without commercial bias. And uh, I am part owner with Dr. Saka here of Optometric Education Consultants. Tracy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have no disclosures to mention. And as Greg mentioned, we've prepared this, uh, the two of us, independently. Thank you. So let me just jump in here just to kind of get things warmed up. You know, here's the agenda. And I put this in here in part of the handout because we do have a lot of states that need this uh, for their DEA and opioid uh, course. So, you know, a lot of times they want to make sure that we talk about the, this, uh, the crisis, the pain definition. And I'm not going to read this whole list to you, but, you know, grading pain and then opioid antagonists and tolerance and addiction and alternatives that are out there. So, um, that's really just to help you in case there's ever have any question with your state um, about, you know, would this qualify? Did we cover all the different topics that need to be covered uh, in an opioid course? And really, you know, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, um, these are just some statistics and why this, you know, why we have to talk about that. Every day, more than 115 people in the United States die after overdosing on opioids. And I'm not going to read every single bullet point, but I want to just point out that it's misuse. You know, it's a serious national crisis. In the centers of disease control and prevention, you know, an, ec an economic burden, misuse. United States, you know, it's a $78.5 billion a year. Roughly 21 to 29% of the patients, you know, were, were on chronic pain, misused them. Um, between 8 and 12% develop an opioid disorder. And again, misuse, transition, first use prescription opioids, overdoses increased, overdoses, you know, increased, you know, in the Midwest and so on and so forth. So it is a crisis. This isn't our first opioid crisis. I went back and looked at history. We're kind of like in our third opioid crisis. It seems like to be like a pandemic about every hundred years that we ran into this. It was somewhere in the early 1900s. And again, somewhere in the early 1800s that there was a, you know, this, so we're kind of in our third crisis. Now, you know, we get really concerned about this. And I guess, you know, being, as Joe said, involved with, you know, with uh, optometry and organized optometry, and we fought and got these battles. And Tracy, being a pharmacist, you know, she has people in chronic pain. These are important to, you know, so we don't really want to scare um, but we just want to make sure that we use these properly and identify the addiction that's out there, there so we can help these patients. So it was, uh, you know, summer of 2017, the National Institutes of Health met and they, they wanted to discuss, you know, safe, effective, non-addictive strategies, new innovative medications, improved overdosing prevention that's out there. And that's why we're on here. 
but you know, I'm going to steal this from Tracy, you know, Tracy, you know, said, you know, Hey, you know, pain is, you know, is important, right? You got a tumor growing somewhere, pushing up against the kidney, you get some pain, you go get it checked out. You know, pain is important for us to, 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 you know, to identify that if not, the cancer would grow way maybe beyond before we'd even know what's happening. So, you know, it's important to our survival. Uh, it's defined as a perception of a harmful stimulus. Uh, it can, uh, you know, absence of injury or long after injury has healed, you can have pain. So there's, you know, pain is again, it's, it's good and it's bad, you know, when it becomes chronic, um, but, you know, we just have to be careful with it. So we just wanted to talk about, uh, you know, pain is, you know, good and bad in a sense. And then I just put this slide up here just to remind everyone that, you know, that, that just part of our brain or uh, uh, that, that, you know, that kind of senses the pain. And then I thought that the, the, the receptors here were important, you know, touch, temperature, proprioception, and the nociception or the receptors out there for pain. But I thought, you know, this was pretty cool how our hands have a lot more, you know, pain receptors in our face and our lips and how they're just kind of proportioned. And that was really the only reason of putting uh, that slide in that picture that's out there. And remember, there's different receptors and different types of uh, modalities out here. And again, you know, pain is unpleasant sensory experience associated with actual potential damage. And the, you know, memories are, are there. So when you touch a, you know, a hot stove, you know, it does create a memory. So the next time that you, oh, is the stove hot or is it cold so that you don't, you know, burn yourself again. And then there is a, a, a huge mental state uh, is known to have a powerful influence because we've seen athletes who have twisted ankles and they don't really feel the pain until it's over. And we all hear these heroic uh, soldiers that are in battle and have serious wounds and, you know, they're able to, you know, carry their, their, their fellow uh, soldiers, wounded soldiers off. And even though while they're wounded, not really feeling the pain until they, you know, they get back to safety and then they can feel something to that, to that effect. So, you know, pharmacology of pain, there's peripheral acting agents, and that's kind of where the NSAIDs and ibuprofen work. And that's when you hear of receptors, peripheral acting, like out of fingertips, that, that substance P. Then I'm going to jump down here real quick, the central acting. And these are these, you're in here, Tracy, talk about these different receptors, mu receptors um, that are kind of scattered all throughout the body. And there's a few other receptors. But then I usually get the question about, you know, how do anesthetics work and proparacaine work? And they're more of a signal inhibiting uh, agent that's out there. So, you know, that's kind of the pharmacology. You're going to hear Tracy and I tonight refer back and forth a lot of the times, you know, peripheral acting, the ibuprofen, your Tylenols are going to talk about central acting. That's all the narcotics that are out there uh, regarding, um, uh, uh, you know, pain management. And the descending pathway uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's out there. And this is, you know, a, a system that in, inhibits cells in the spinal cord. So the picture here is you have, you now this is that peripheral where it says right here, aspirin is acting. Uh, and so what happens is you have the, the, the flame here that's burning the fingers. And this is why you pulled away so quick, because when it goes into the spinal cord, when those, when those pain receptors are triggered and it just automatically just goes right to the muscle to pull your hand away. So it doesn't really have to go up to your brain and be processed when certain uh, receptors are triggered in those pain to just pull your hand out of there before a lot of damage gets happened. But also now it does go up to the spinal cord. It does get uh, processed in the brain. And then you could see here kind of like the opioid drugs in a sense, working on these receptors that we're talking about. And then you have that descending pathway where, where these opioid uh, medications can work centrally. So again, you have the central acting where in this, and you're gonna hear us talk about these mu receptors. They're kind of all over the body. A lot of people just think that they're in the spinal cord, but there we do have a picture here of kind of how they're all located throughout the body. And then again, the peripheral acting is out here where the kind of the trauma or this camera is, act, is, is, uh, is, is, is creating. So Tracy, I know I always kind of get this up to about 5,000 or, or 35,000 feet, and then we let you take over. But that was just kind of to do that little reminder because of all the opioids that's out there. As this poll is running, please, please fill in. And Joe, if you want to launch that poll there, polling question number one, that would be launched. great. Thank you. Yep, I see it. 
So, you know, what type of pain does not respond well or at all to uh, opioid uh, 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 pharmaceuticals? Is it nociceptive pain or is it neuropathic pain? And anything out there, Trace, you want to make a comment on kind of pain in general and the ascending, descending or... Uh, I think you hit it pretty well. Yeah, it's it's there's there's so many different aspects to pain management, pain syndromes, and you know, kind of as you were talking, I was thinking of the humongous portion that you you know that psychology plays. Uh, so that's something that we don't even hit on, but that's a huge part of all this. Right. So people are responding nicely here to our polling question. So what type of pain does not respond well or at all to uh, opioid pharmaceuticals? And by the way, for those who, who came in a minute or two late, I have, re, I have relaunched in the chat the, uh, the handout for tonight. Perfect. So I'm going to end the uh, poll here. Looks like most people have weighed in. I'm going to share the results. And uh, we can see here that it's almost a 50-50 split, but... Uh, 54% uh, of the people said neuropathic and uh, 46 had said uh, nociceptive pain. Trace, you want to talk about that? Uh, and I'm going to stop sharing the, 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 the results here. Sure. So it's, it's a logical kind of thought process to look at uh, pain management and think, you know, what do opioids treat? You know, the truth of the matter is when we use an opioid, we really should only be seeing it used for patients that have no susceptive pain. And that is, as the slide uh, met, uh, says, and as Greg was mentioning as well, it's kind of normal processing of pain. You cut your finger off, your finger hurts. You get hit in the head, your head hurts. So we have multiple different drug classes that can treat that kind of pain, but opioids are great against no susceptive pain. Not implying at all that they should be first line therapy, but they work fairly fast, they get the job done. And you'll see as we move through this that, you know, one of our major goals of, a, of the management of acute pain in any patient, optometric or otherwise, um, is that we wanna control that patient's pain as much as possible with as few side effects as we can imagine, or as we can, you know, kind of predict in the pen. But that would include even steroid eye drops. You know, it doesn't have to be an opioid. On the flip side, that neuropathic pain, that, you know, if you think of like sciatica is a good example that most people have heard of, um, or uh, a, a major injury that over time has resulted in kind of um, burning sensation or shooting pain. In general, no susceptive pain does not respond well to opioids at normal doses. I mean, we could gork anybody out on a major dose of an opioid and knock them out, and we could say, oh, look, we, we controlled their pain really, really well. But that's not the point of, of really using the medications appropriately in most situations. So we'll go through some of these examples and you know, allude to the non-steroidals, et cetera, as well as the opioids. When you were talking about gorking them out, you were referring to neuropathic pain, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. If, if you want to really treat neuropathic pain well, you've got to go high doses in most, most cases. Yeah. I think you might've said nociceptive. And I just want to make sure that we were clear that you were There is talking. a chance I did. That's, so fine. That's okay. That's just, I just want to make sure everyone knew that yeah. you know, neuropathic pain does not respond well. So when we talk about that, we're talking about someone who has zoster, right? We, that's one that's, that's in our, in our wheelhouse as optometrists. Someone gets a herpes zoster in their trigeminal nerve um, division number one, uh, the ophthalmic division, and you know, uh, you know, six months, nine months, twelve months later, they still have pain. Um, you touch them; that's that hypersensitivity. That's not going to respond well to the to the neuropathic pain. So, um, Trey, see if you got control of the slides, and I think the next few are going to be yours. See if it, see if you can advance the slides. Right, let's see if it'll let me here. There you right. go. Oh, it was, was delayed. Yeah, All right, you. let me go yeah. back here. Is that the right slide? Yep. Okay, so uh, in looking at different treatment options for neuropathic pain, I just want to run through just a couple of different options because we're not going to spend 
really much time on this at all, but it's part of the curriculum. So when we look at neuropathic pain, which is really kind of an abnormal processing of pain, uh, we're looking at things that we typically call adjunctive or add-on medications for the most part. Some of them have addiction potential and, and a few of them you're very familiar with. So if you look here at that first little uh, indent, that clipboard indent, it says anti-seizure medications that address nerve damage or inflammation. And that's key because that's what we're dealing with here with neuropathic pain. So we have things that work on the, the GABA system, like a benzodiazepine. So those types of medications go in and make the inhibitory GABA system more inhibitory. So it's further slowing down neuronal transmission systemically, but you know that's sort of the trade-off when we're dealing with systemic medications. So you see Xanax there, that's an example. Valium would be an example. Ativan would be an example. And then the next bullet says gabapentin, that Neurontin. It is now a controlled substance in multiple states because its baby brother, that third indent there, pregabal and Lyrica, when it was approved, came out as a Schedule 4. So now, you know, many states have reworked the um, control over control status over gabapentin because it does have some addiction potential, particularly when taken in high dose. And then again, going back to that adjunctive or add-on therapy, you're going to see patients that have neuropathic pain on sleep aids. You're going to see them on medications for depression and anxiety in some cases as well. So it's a multimodal treatment plan as it should be. All right, uh, and then these are some of the examples of chronic pain syndromes that you may see in your patients or that you may have heard of. There's that trigeminal neuralgia, postherpetic neuralgia, diabetic neuropathy, et cetera, all the way down to alcoholism, diabetes, poorly controlled or uncontrolled long-term can cause that peripheral neuropathy, which can be very painful, um, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia. It is just a, a huge list of different levels and different types and locations of neuropathic pain that becomes chronic in patients and, and really, you know, affects life greatly. So our typical list, including the anti-seizures that I mentioned before, you will also see sometimes a uh, tricyclic antidepressant, which is one of our oldest antidepressants from the 1950s. And if you look at this list over here to the right, um, you know, we're looking at things like nortriptyline, uh, amitriptyline, etc. Those are terrible antidepressants, but they're pretty good for neuropathic pain and even to help patients sleep when they have pain syndromes. So we have some choices. And then not just the gabapentin or the pregabalin, we have some additional anti-seizure medications that can be used for uh, neuropathic pain. And the reason why the list is so long for these options is because we will try one in a patient and if it doesn't help their neuropathic pain, or it causes too many side effects, cognition issues, sedation, et cetera, we switch to another. So at least we have the opportunity to kind of, you know, play around with some of the medication regimens, which is so important. Acute versus chronic pain, as optometrists, you're going to be really dealing, you know, from a practitioner perspective and a prescribing perspective, mostly with acute pain. And, um, you're going to look at things like acetaminophen, non-steroidals, maybe opioids, which is what we're doing tonight. And then don't forget once again about glucocorticosteroids, either systemically or in the form of an ocular med um, or even some non-steroidals in the case of an ocular uh, medication. We don't always just mean systemic, meaning it's getting into the bloodstream and distributing. Sometimes the ocular meds are fine. And then in chronic pain, you see a similar list, but with the addition of tricyclic antidepressants, some anti-seizure meds, you're going to see sleep meds, meds used very specifically for depression and anxiety, et cetera, muscle relaxers. So you would expect a patient sitting across from you that comes in and they filled out their list of medications that you're evaluating now, you could expect them to have many medications on that list that they would be using for the different aspects of chronic pain. It's a tough way to live, but good practitioners change patients' lives. So that, from your perspective, is going to be more, well, if I have a patient here that has chronic pain, that's going to potentially change what you're doing in evaluating and treating a patient for many different optometric uh, issues. 
I already mentioned this and, and Greg jump in uh, whenever you need to or I'll just keep yapping here. Um, the goals for acute and chronic pain are going to be different. Acute pain, we wanna keep the patient as comfortable as possible while trying to minimize the adverse effects from the pain meds. Keep in mind, and Greg already mentioned this, we're going to look briefly at the receptors but because pain is a, a life-saving, you know, kind of from an evolution perspective, we have to know that pain is usually attached to something going wrong. It doesn't have to be necessarily just an injury, as Greg mentioned. So uh, we have receptors that these drugs, the opioids, plug into from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. We have more in certain areas, but that doesn't mean just the skin. We have them everywhere on internal organs, in our gut, et cetera. So managing those side effects is a real art for sure. The goals for managing chronic pain are to keep the patient as comfortable as possible, but the biggest thing for a chronic pain patient is for them to realize it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be completely pain-free. And that's what I mean by different psychological aspects. A patient has to learn, well, this is now my new reality and the body is deciding, okay, this is the new homeostasis that we're going to have to deal with. So we hit it from many different avenues and uh, treatment remedies and cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera. When do you move from acute pain to chronic pain? Most of the time when a patient is not improving and now you're treating them with non-steroidals, acetaminophen, muscle relaxers, opioids, you know, three plus weeks and it doesn't look like there's an end in sight, that's when you sort of are transitioning a patient from acute pain management to more of a chronic scenario. Doesn't mean it has to be forever, but sometimes it is. I don't know why this is delayed. Let me try it again. Okay. Pain assessments and scales. Um, it, pain is subjective. And, you know, I say all the time, and Greg mentioned this as well, everybody's different. You know, we all have that emergency system, that fight or flight or fright, like Greg was mentioning, when you have a soldier who's, who's you know, almost, he could be mortally wounded, but was still able to drag his or her two buddies off the battlefield before they went down and anybody realized, oh my gosh, they've been shot. So there's adrenaline and different systems that are involved in that. But then there's also a true subjective portion to this. You could have a patient that would be sitting there saying, oh, I'm definitely at a 10. Um, you know, chewing gum, filing their nails, and tying their shoe without any discomfort whatsoever. You could pretty much look at that patient and think, I don't think that they're at a 10 on a 1 to 10 scale with 10 being the worst. But we can't look at patients and assume that everybody's going to be fibbing about their pain. So, the pain assessments and scales add objectivity to a very subjective problem with our patients. So, uh, you know, always keep in mind, no patient should needlessly suffer. Does the injury or wound or diagnosis fit the patient's presentation? So Greg will have some um, slides for you and pictures where you'll look at it and think, yeah, the patient can't possibly be in that much pain. But then upon further diagnostics, you realize, oh yes, I can see why they would be in that much pain. So it's important to be able to assess this in some way, shape or form without completely relying on what the patient is just saying verbally, body language, all those other things as well. So on the next slide, we have this combination pain scale. And I, I've said this before, you know, I sort of randomly Google things just to see how easy are they to find for practitioners or patients alike. I love this one because it combines, you know, kind of three and a half different pain assessment scales. We have the number scale over at the top, zero to 10, zero being no pain, 10 being worst pain possible. We also have the uh, verbal descriptor scale at the bottom uh, where it's zero is no pain, one to three, oh, by the way, is called mild pain. So on a one to 10 scale, he is accepted mild pain. Four to six is the medical standard for moderate pain. And seven to nine or 10 is what we call severe pain. And sometimes when you explain to a patient or they read, oh, okay, if I'm at a six, I would be able to sit through this uh, CE, but I would start to get uncomfortable. I'd have to get up and move around. I might have to go stretch. I might have to take a pain medication to help me get through. Whereas a four, on the same range for moderate, a four versus a six, a four, you'd be able to kind of sit for a longer period of time. You'd be uncomfortable, but you'd be able to concentrate to some extent, maybe for the entire, you know, one hour and 50 minutes. Um, but yet they're both in that same moderate scale. 
that's where different options for treatment come in. And then lastly here, we have the Wong Baker Facial Grimace Scale, which I love particularly for kids or those um, that maybe don't speak English or can't read uh, the English language and you, know, you don't have uh, anything available to help them otherwise. And then we have the colors as well light green is good, red is bad. So this is just a great example of validated scales that we can use for our patients. And sometimes when you use more than one, you get a better idea of, you know, the true level of their, their pain. Anything to add there, Greg? Yeah, you can, you kind of mentioned it, but I think uh, what I just want to kind of highlight and echo is, you know, I do use these pain scales in my, in my, in my office. Um, and a lot of people are like, you know, you know, do, is it like a, like a hospital room? I think you we've all been in a hospital room and you see it up on the wall and people that, you know, that do, or that are on pain medication, the, the, the staff come in and they ask, you know, Hey, where are you today on your pain scale and so on and so forth. So, you know, do I keep one of those like taped up in my office? The answer is no, I have an electronic health record in my office. Tracy mentioned she Googles it. I just go and do combination pain scale, you know, to a Google, click on images, find one of them, open it up, and then just right there say to the patient, okay, you know, you got this trauma, got your eye numbed right now before I numbed your eye, you know, where were you on the scale? They come over and then they point, well, my face is kind of like this, or I'm a six or a seven. And that really just helps me out whenever I'm treating, you know, if I'm especially going to reach out and, and prescribe uh, an opioid. So a lot of people are like, well, you know, what should I do? Print one out? Yeah, just, you know, most of us have electronic health records. Just Google it and uh, just pull it right up there and have them look. So Exactly. All right. So they, they changed my, uh, they changed my video. They pulled it off. So this is going to be, uh, you know, like the, the pain scale, but different, uh, that's out there um, when I was reviewing it. So, you know, I thought this was kind of cute. I was on an airplane uh, and I big Disney fan. I think most of you might know that know me. I like going to Disney. We have annual passes, just renewed them this week. And, um, but knowing that I wanted to watch a Disney movie while flying from back from one of the conferences. And I think it's big hero six and I was watching it and uh, there was uh, you know, Baymax and let's see if this launches and this plays. Let me know if you can hear the sound Tracy. So with that being said, you know, there was a whole other part of, of the, uh, of the video that I liked and it talked about, you know, how I guess Baymax came around, but they put on there the, the, the adhesive and he pulls it off. Baymax comes out of nowhere and, you know, on the scale of one to 10, you know, what's your pain. And I just thought it was just kind of neat that, you know, Disney had picked up in this kind of futuristic way of treating uh, maybe a patient that they're using the pain scale. So I just thought it was kind of neat that it was out there. So that was, those are my comments on pain scales, Tracy, and then the video that I like to show. So do you want to take care of uh, uh, the, 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 the three groups of analgesics? Sure. sure. Uh, okay. So uh, again, kind of reviewing just in a little bit more of a um, organized format, I, get ra I guess, rather than just mentioning them. Uh, remember, we've got our non-opioids. They are just as vital as our opioids for the management of many different types of, of treatment modalities. We've got our acetaminophen, Tylenol. We've got our non-steroidals. Over the counter, we've got ibuprofen, naproxen sodium, and then again, our glucocorticosteroids, methylprednisolone, prednisone, um, dexamethasone, et cetera. And sometimes they are part of the opioid treatment plan, meaning you may use acetaminophen plus ibuprofen plus an opioid to work synergistically, meaning they help each other work better and to decrease the total amount of opioid that a patient needs. So it's multi-modality treatment. And under opioids there, you can see we have three very specific ones. We have codeine, which you'll see in a moment is typically under the brand name brand name Tylenol number three. We've got our hydrocodone in Vicodin, which uh, is still able to be prescribed in, in 
a decent number of states now, uh, despite the fact that it's a Schedule II. We'll go through that and I'll have Greg comment on it later on. And then we have tramadol, uh, Ultram. So these are really your foundational opioids that you might consider using. And if you know you guys fought to get your DEA licenses, so it's good to kind of see where these might be appropriate You know, for short little blurbs of time in patients down the road. Hey, Tracy, I think most docs would, you know, when they talk about non-opioids would easily say NSAIDs and under NSAIDs, you know, the the Tylenol, the Advils and and so on and so forth. But, you know, and what about glucocorticosteroids? Is that just because of it's treating the inflammation? You know, someone comes over with an iritis in their eye, we use steroids. Is it the inflammatory part where that works? Because I you know, when we started lecturing on this years ago, you were always like, hey, don't forget about the, the, the steroids. So where does that work in that pain? Is it the inflammatory pathways? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, a couple steps up from ibuprofen or naproxen sodium. You know, they're both anti-inflammatory, as you all know. Ibuprofen and its brothers and sisters are anti-inflammatory at more on the higher end of the dosing regimen, but they all inhibit those um, inflammatory mediators. It's just that the glucocorticosteroids are more of a global, you know, hitting it hard uh, type situation. So I always teasingly say, you know, I, I, everybody probably knows by now I have RA and lupus. So the few times where I've had to take prednisone at a reasonable dose, I don't like it at high dose. It makes me a crazy person, but you know, low dose, everybody feels better on a steroid because it's just controlling pain from the inflammatory, um, inflammatory direction. And it's a wonderful way to manage pain in, in most scenarios. Yeah. I just think most people don't realize that it's, you know, just, you know, kind of in the same category, you know, again, well, it is in the same category of Tylenol and ibuprofen. So yeah, mm-hmm. just higher up on the, on that scale, like you said, please, t- please go with the controlled substance here and the different schedules. All right. And just as a quick reminder, uh, we have five schedules of controlled substances in the United States uh, overseen by, you know, the FDA oversees it from a what are the drugs perspective, but it's really overseen by the Drug Enforcement Agency, and they are the ones that come up with these specific categories. So a lot of them make good sense. Some of them you kind of scratch your head. Schedule one, for instance, it says not considered to be medically necessary. These drugs or chemicals are used for research only. Well, you can look at that list and understand, well, medical marijuana, that's a state issue. So it's still a Schedule I controlled substance on the federal level. controlled substance schedule, for lack of a better way to explain it. Um, But from a state perspective, some states allow it, some states don't, some states allow it a lot, some just a little. So uh, it's kind of a, a crazy list when you consider how can heroin, LSD, ecstasy, and peyote mushrooms be in the same category as marijuana. Um, and CBD has since been removed from the, the Schedule One list because we know a lot more about it. So those are pretty much off the off the list of what we can use, other than the marijuana portion. In uh, as we look from state to state, but Schedule Two now is a much tidier list because if you look at what we um, call our true opioids or narcotics, we have a full list. We have our oxycodone, hydrocodone, morphine, hydromorphone, methadone, fentanyl. Um, that's not the entire list, but pretty much those that you would be familiar with. And up until 2014, it was an incomplete list because that second medication, hydrocodone, which is well known to be seen in Vicodin, Lorset, Norco, that was a Schedule Three controlled substance. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But now it was moved 2014 to a Schedule Two, So it really is a complete list of our more likely to be abused narcotics. And that's the other thing that I'll mention as we finish moving through the uh, other schedules on the next slide. These schedules are based upon the government's perspective on how likely are they to be addictive um, or abused. So schedule one is the most likely to be abused. Schedule five is least likely to be abused. So here we have our schedule three. Um, once again, this is you know getting getting safer, less likely to be abused as compared to the schedule two. What you will see as a potential drug you can use for your patients is that codeine mixed with acetaminophen. Usually, we don't tend to use the product mixed with aspirin. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, S-ketamine 
it's just a slightly different structure. Well, it, it gets cleaved into ketamine. That's going to be, uh, it already is available as a nasal spray for treatment resistant depression. Schedule four is going to be our tramadol, which we mentioned as a potential great drug choice for your patients in some scenarios. And then schedule five is still codeine, but it's codeine as a cough suppressant. So the concentration per dosing unit is much lower. That's why you have codeine in more than one category. So if you don't have that hydrocodone exception in your state, you'll be pulling from schedule three and schedule four. Some of you uh, are fortunate enough to have the hydrocodone exception. You can pull from two, three, or four single agents from there in particular. Tracy, were you aware of the, uh, the, the law that passed in Pennsylvania last, uh, last November um, that is allowing us the hydrocodone fixes in Pennsylvania, just FYI, since you practice? Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that was, that was great news, wasn't it? Yep. Hard, hard fought for, for sure. So then uh, I mentioned some of this, we have our marijuana. I said it's already a schedule one under the federal um, perspective and then it is state controlled. And then I did also mention the hydrocodone issue which was it moved from schedule three to schedule two in 2014 and some states do have the ability for optometrists to write prescriptions for that in appropriate patients. And that includes Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Greg and, and Joe would know better than I would uh, how many states have that. But I think the number's increasing, you know, uh, as time goes by here. Yep. So here we have our opioids, our narcotics, and it says mainstay of therapy for the treatment of pain. And what I mean by that is that does that that is not to imply that every patient who has pain should immediately go to a narcotic. That is not implying that somebody comes in with a fracture and you know into the emergency room and they put an IV in um, just in case, which is sort of typical for a, an emergency room. And maybe they'll give them a you know dose or two of some pain medication while they're sitting there waiting to get you know, the x-rays or waiting for the orthopod to come in or whatever the case may be. They may not give them an, an opioid. They might give them an IV dose of, you know, uh, ketorolac. Um, so we have lots of different choices, but when we say what's kind of the drug class that will treat most types of pain nociceptive well, it's our narcotics because they're fast, our opioids. No maximum daily dose limitation for most of these agents. Think about that statement. No maximum daily dose limitation for most of these agents. That's why you see patients who are taking opioids, particularly if they are on the chronic pain um, diagnosis, that their doses can increase over time. So, you know, they might start on 10 milligrams of OxyContin when they're first diagnosed with chronic pain and 20 years down the line, they might be on 80 milligrams of OxyContin three times a day. That is more common than you think. On the flip side, we do have drugs like tramadol. That one does have a maximum daily dose. Doesn't mean that people don't push it, but it has a multi-mechanism that we'll get to. It's also true why you see somebody who can um, inject heroin at doses, you can have somebody who's been a heroin addict for you know a month and their doses are, are still obnoxious, but not as bad as somebody who maybe has been a heroin user for several years. The amount of heroin that somebody can put into their body is crazy. But again, the body doesn't look at it and say, no, I would prefer OxyContin or OxyCodone. That would be better for me rather than heroin. The body doesn't realize one's a schedule one, one's a schedule two. It's just letting that drug plug into different receptors. Tolerance starts to develop and that's where we get the increasing need for more drug, whether it's a patient who really is not an abuser or a true drug, drug abuser. It's kind of a, a interesting, uh, rabbit hole to go down in terms of the thought process. We use opioids for acute and chronic pain, which we mentioned, and now we're going to get a little bit into the receptors because it helps you understand why they work. And more importantly, um, not just the efficacy, but what about the side effects? What about the toxicity that can occur from these agents? So if you have a brief and healthy perspective on where these opioid receptors are located, it's so much easier to remember potential side effects. So these opioids are one of the most pure example receptors, and I'm too much into that means that these drugs, oxycodone, tramadol, codeine, Vicodin, all, all these different drugs, they're plugging into 
receptors in the body that your endogenous or internal chemicals have already done for whatever pain we're treating. So when you have some sort of insult or injury to the body, you already have down here at the bottom, the enkephalins, dynorphins, endorphins that are being released. Those endogenous or internal chemicals are plugging into these opioid receptors. When it's not enough to treat the pain, that's when we take a drug class like the opioids, exogenous, outside in, to substitute for the enkephalins, endorphins, dinorphins. They plug into those same receptors. It's pretty awesome, actually, from a pharmacology perspective, at least. So here's the list of receptors just ever so quickly. We have mu receptors, kappa receptors, and delta receptors. And again, I already said these will give us the benefit of using an opioid, as well as the pretty large list of problems that, that may occur. So our mu receptors are really uh, the most the most well-known opioid receptor. So if somebody said, I know we have three opioid receptors, but, but tell me which one is really the most ideal in terms of treatment. It is the mu receptor. The problem is with a lot of these drugs, we can't separate the drug going into mu and to kappa and to delta. We can't do that. They, the drug plugs in where it plugs in, and it's not like you can program a little tiny GPS on an oxycodone tablet before you ingest it. It's going to plug in where it fits. So our mu receptors produce analgesia, which is what we want. Euphoria, can't help that. Meiosis, sedation, constipation, respiratory depression, which is typically what kills a patient, and addiction. The euphoria is normal, but it can be terrifying because I was just watching a, um, a quick documentary on a patient today who a, a person who was a heroin user and is now clean and this young man said you know I broke my ankle I was a football player in college broke my ankle um, I was away from home uh, you know while I was recovering they gave me oxycodone and the minute I took that one dose of oxycodone it was like I had never lived and the, you know this kid didn't have really a troubled past he was saying I, I didn't realize how wonderful I could feel and he then very quickly went on to um, develop a heroin addiction down the line and it's because that euphoria it's your chemistry it's that that, you know, sense of well-being, and in some people, it's what triggers that dopamine reward response. If you have the genetics and some of the personality characteristics as well for addiction, this is where it starts in some people. Not in everybody, but in some. And then we have our kappa receptors. Those also induce analgesic uh, results, diuresis, sedation, meiosis, dysphoria, psychomimetic effects, etc. Our, our dysphoria is, you know, something I say, Patients who get dysphoria just means that their drug receptor um, affinity is more for kappa rather than mu. So it probably means they either have more kappa receptors than the general population, or you know, for whatever reason, the location of the kappa receptors is you know slightly altered. Who knows? But I, I do always say that people who have the dysphoric effect from opioids won't become opioid addicts. And I've told the story a million times if I've told it once. The craziest one I've ever heard is a guy who was coming out when I was a resident out of surgery and he kind of was coming to and he's like, I don't know what you guys gave me. He had gotten fentanyl. He said, but I never wanted again. I was um, dreaming that Mickey Mouse was chasing me with a meat cleaver. So he wouldn't really have an issue with becoming a, an addict because he wasn't getting that, you know, that Yahoo feeling from the drug. And then Delta receptors, those give us an analgesic uh, portion of pain control as well. So you would look at this and say, well, why don't we just use Delta receptor agonists? Why do we have to use all three? And I already said, you can't you can't control where a chemical goes. And delta receptors by themselves are not very potent uh, pain receptors. So we wish we had more control over some of these. Yeah, I didn't get you, you know, on the mu receptor, Tracy. Usually you do the uh, woohoo. <laughs> the woohoo. I, I had my second dose of the COVID vaccine yesterday. I told uh, Greg and Joe that I, I feel like my brain is rattling. So I don't know if I have woohoo in me today. <laughs> there you go. There we go. We got it out of yet. So. Okay. Let's see here. So then I don't know why this is a, 
doing that, but we'll, we'll muddle through here. So you're going to see two different formulations in patients. As prescribers, uh, you know, as optometric physicians that are going to have prescribing privileges for some of these, you're going to stick with the immediate release formulations. Because again, you're really going to be, you know, concentrating on acute pain management. Patients presenting, they have this problem, um, and we want to try to deal with the pain for a day or two or, you know, maybe a little bit longer. So it's the immediate release formulations that you're going to use. That's also true of patients that end up, you know, in the emergency room, urgent care, um, in a dental chair because they have tooth pain from, uh, you know, something that needs to be root canal or whatever the case may be. It makes sense because if you have pain, you want to take something that starts to work either almost immediately with IV formulations or, you know, within a reasonable amount of time. Where if you look at controlled release opioids, and that's OxyContin, we'll see that in a list in a second, those are more specifically used for patients who have chronic pain, and it could be cancer or non-cancer chronic pain, it doesn't matter which one, it, you know, we, we use it for that, because these long-acting or controlled release formulations give you a nice steady blood level that we say gives basal control, B-A-S-A-L, basal control of the pain. Think of it like metformin and diabetes. Metformin isn't peaking in the bloodstream and giving you these high anti-glucose levels. It's not. It's working quietly behind the scenes to give just nice, steady control of the patient's blood glucose and insulin or resistance and all that good stuff. But here's the interesting part. In a patient that has chronic pain, you will many times see them on both a long-acting opioid and a short-acting or immediate-release opioid because we use them for two different things. So that's not unusual. So if you have a patient coming in, sitting across from you in, in your chair and you're looking through their medications, don't assume just because they're on two different opioids that, that they have a, a drug problem. They could be on long acting morphine and then they might take Percocet, which is oxycodone and acetaminophen uh, as needed for breakthrough pain. So it's not unusual at all. It's pretty much the standard for treatment of pain. So we'll just go through the structures really quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these because it's not necessary, but it's an interesting discussion as you can see how these kind of grow from one category to the next. Morphine is our prototype and a prototype for drugs means it's the first one that comes out in a category or it's just the one that turned out to be one of the best. So we compare all other opioids in this class to morphine and that predominantly was because we started using morphine as a true pain medication um, very early. So morphine is the standard to which all of those are compared. That's important because it's also the one that we compare doses. So when we talk about the potency of an opioid, if a patient's on oxycodone this dose, we compare it to, well, how much does that equal in morphine equivalence? And the, the significance of that from an optometric physician perspective is the FDA in particular has really cracked down. Greg was mentioning the opioid crisis and, you know, in the past um, five, eight, 10 years, you know, once every 100 years we have one. Um, the FDA has has really put, put out a mandate saying that chronic pain patients should not take more than 90 milligrams of morphine. That's a lot of morphine, but people take a lot more than that. Chronic pain patients should not take more than 90 milligrams of morphine daily or morphine equivalent. And that's where that term comes from. So you can figure out how much oxycodone a patient is taking and you can equate that to how much it would be in morphine. And insurance companies will crack down on that. They do that by, um, CVS is a perfect example. Uh, if you go to have a prescription filled I had a guy who had major back surgery, went and got a prescription uh, to a CVS to get it filled. And he's like, I'm going to be in pain for probably, you know, one to two months. They wouldn't pay for more than five days. And that's pretty much standard in almost all states that they only have to pay for five days of pain medications. And then after that, you have to get that prior authorization or patients end up paying out of pocket. It's, it's because of this morphine equivalent issue. So you could have guessed morphine's for severe pain. We have different formulations, as I alluded to uh, a moment ago. Here's that first one, MSIR. That's the brand name, but it's pretty clever. MSIR means morphine sulfate immediate release. And then we have our long-acting uh, morphines here at the bottom. The MS-Contin, which is very 
very old but great drug, Cadian and Avenza. So they go everywhere from, you know, eight eight hours length for MS Contin to one capsule every 24 hours for Avenza. Not everybody needs 24 hours control of their 24 hour control of their pain. So MS Contin is used a lot of times because sometimes patients have times during the day when their pain is worse. So that's when they take the long acting morphine, lasts for eight to 12 hours, and then they're drug free the rest of the day. When you said prior authorization there, do you, you created me pain, just so you know. So I'm, I'm <laughs> oh my gosh, it creates pain for everybody. <laughs> The P word. It's a PA, right? Prior authorization. Ah, but again, sorry. <laughs> it's always it's always a struggle, isn't it? Yeah. So hydromorphone, you can tell that it is structurally related to morphine. It is a more potent substance, and I'll show you that morphine equivalent example here just very quickly. Hydromorphone, brand name Dilaudid. It shows you that this is an immediate release product just based upon how patients take it. That's why I threw in the directions there for you. It's very potent, and that's what I have here at the bottom. So I gave you a quick example to compare it to morphine. So we always do our equivalents based upon 30 milligrams of morphine. You can use lower amounts, but that's just sort of the standard medical milligram amount of morphine. So eight milligrams of hydromorphone dilaudid is equivalent to 30 milligrams of morphine. So you can tell that hydromorphone is a more potent substance because you take less of it to get the same pain control as 30 milligrams of morphine. And that's how we use it. So in other words, this is saying that if you wanted to keep patients under that 90 milligrams per day of morphine or morphine equivalent FDA mandate, that would mean 24 milligrams of dilaudid per day is going to be the max. That's a lot of dilaudid, but patients get there pretty easily. We can do the same thing with our codeine based products. So here we have uh, codeine with Tylenol. We'll see in a second. That's a schedule three. Everything that we've done so far has been a schedule two. And then the other two products that are in the true narcotic opioid schedule two system uh, or list are hydrocodone and oxycodone. So codeine is a, a weaker analgesic for sure. So here's our codeine. I already said it's a weak analgesic. 200 milligrams of codeine is what you would have to take to equal 30 milligrams of morphine. That's a pretty healthy amount of codeine. So that's why it's a, a fairly, you know, it's a, it's a safer drug to use uh, from a pain control perspective in a lot of patients. So I can have Greg comment on this, but you see in the middle star there, that Tylenol number three, that's the brand name. It comes as Tylenol number two, Tylenol number three, Tylenol number four, but Tylenol three, number three is the one that you should choose, the generic. If you write Tylenol number three, we'll give the generic automatically uh, in the pharmacy. Uh, because of its ratio of acetaminophen and codeine and because of the amount of codeine that's in there. And these are for immediate uh, release use, acute pain. Anything to add there, Greg? Yeah. I mean, you just kind of said it and where I usually make comments is, uh, is and when we talk about the best ratio is we, we know that, you know, it used to be the 4,000 milligrams, uh, uh, yeah, 4,000 milligrams of, of, of acetaminophen or APAP was needed uh, years ago, and then they change it to three grams or 3000 milligrams. So in a sense, you can give, you know, 10 pills of, of one of these ratios here. And, and basically to like, you usually give two, so that gives you 600, then you get the 60 milligrams. It's just, it's just the best ratio that's out there. And that's they, like Tracy said, they do make T, T2, T4, but T3 is usually, you know, you give two tablets of T3, you know, a couple times a day for their pain. It's just the best ratio out there between the balance of the acetaminophen with the liver problems and the, you know, the addiction side, if you want to say, or the tickling of those mu and kappa receptors on the codeine side. So it's just best ratio. And you can get it. You know, I, I mentioned all the time that Tylenol number two and Tylenol number four, most pharmacies don't care of them because we just don't use them. So if you have a patient who needs pain meds today and, you know, a pharmacy says, well, we can get it for you, but we have to order it for Tylenol number four or Tylenol number two, it might be two or three or four days before they can get it. So if you stick with Tylenol number three generic, it's everybody has it all the time. That's a, an important consideration as well. So that was codeine. And then we have its big brother and sister, oxycodone, being the first one here. Oxycodone is one of our most popular acute pain management medications. And it's also one of the most highly abused uh, medications because 
some of it has to do with the fact that so many people can prescribe it and so many people do. So for immediate release, our, our most infamous product is Percocet. And then we have Endocet, which is just kind of a, it's, it's a generic medication, but it has kind of its own brand name, Percocet, Endocet, and then a ton of generic formulations as well. Notice strength five of oxycodone, of acetaminophen and that goes all the way up to 10 milligrams of oxycodone and 325 milligrams of acetaminophen. Percocet and Endocet used to only be available as 5, 500. Well, I guess it was 5, 325, excuse me, I'm thinking Vicodin. So if somebody said I'm giving my patient Percocet, it always meant 5 milligrams of oxycodone and 325 of acetaminophen. But then we got different formulations. It would be um, Percocet, uh, HP, high potency, et cetera. The one thing I would like to mention, though, that Greg already uh, alluded to just a few moments ago, all acetaminophen products that are prescription and that only includes because there are no there are no prescription strength acetaminophen except for those that are in combination with opioids, et cetera. All of them have to be 325 milligrams of acetaminophen or Tylenol per dosing unit or less. So gone are the days of 500 milligrams in a tablet along with five milligrams of hydrocodone or whatever because of that FDA sort of soft mandate that we lower the max daily dose from 4,000 milligrams to 3,000 milligrams per day of, of acetaminophen or Tylenol. So drug manufacturers had to completely redo everything. At the bottom, just real quick, well, two things. It says question mark, more addictive than heroin. A lot of people will say it was the oxycodone that really, uh, you know, tickled that dopamine response system and uh, kind of gave them that feeling that they could do anything and that they wanted to continue taking it. Oxycodone is more potent than morphine. So um, not that that matters as much as just understanding that we make considerations regarding changes in dose based upon those morphine equivalents. Many drug manufacturers are, are trying to control, some of it I think is just trying to control their reputation in the press um, by making opioid formulations that are less likely to be adulterated. And they call them unadulteratable opioids. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. The only way you can ensure non-adulteratable or unadulteratable opioids would be to get rid of all of them or lock them up where nobody could get to them. That would be the only way. And here's a perfect example. Oxycodone um, in the in brand name OxyContin, you can tell by the name Oxy. Content, it's oxycodone continuous release, another clever brand name. So it's long acting. And uh, about 10, 15 years ago, the OxyContin manufacturers had a patent infringement lawsuit with all the generics saying that the generic companies came out with their formulations too soon and they won. So in the meantime, when all of this was going on over a few years, the OxyContin manufacturer um, actually remanufactured the coating on OxyContin to make it less likely to be abused. But look at what that means. Here we have the manual crushing, which is what people do um, if they're trying to get high. So we have the one on the right hand side, which looks like a powder. So people take an OxyContin tablet and they crush it with whatever they have. And then on the next slide, you'll see that they just mix it with um, some water soluble or water based substance and you can draw it up into the syringe and then they inject it. The newer formulation, which was supposed to be unadulteratable for OxyContin, if you crush it, it's got kind of a gel-like coating on the outside, so you can't make it into a powder. Well, that doesn't mean a darn thing, because I've had people who are addicts or former addicts say, well, I just sucked on it first to get rid of that outside coating. It's all you have to do is suck on it to get rid of that. Or you can mix it with something that's not completely water-based over here on the left, um, add something that's got a little bit of alcohol to it, and you can get it you know sucked up into a syringe just fine so where there is an addiction there is a way to get it into your body so there is no such thing as that unadulteratable hydrocodone products to kind of finish out the true narcotics that we're looking at here we've got hydrocodone mixed with acetaminophen and of course the most common brand name for that is vicodin the, the other brand names that are available they're not new they've been around forever like vicodin norco and lortab but they all contain hydrocodone and acetaminophen at either identical strengths or 
25 milligram difference between the acetaminophen doses. So whatever the case may be, patient's going to get a generic uh, product when they go to the pharmacy to get it anyhow. It is interesting if you have patients who come in and they say, oh, by the way, I can't take any generic oxycodone or they, this would be hydrocodone for, for you folks if you have that um, Vicodin exception. They, they might say, and this is not all that uncommon, I can't take any generic Vicodin. I can only take the brand name. There may be some truth to that, but more than likely there's something hanky going on. And that is because you, you get a higher uh, dollar amount on the street if you're distributing medications for brand name medications. Um, it also, you know, alludes to the fact that the patient is sort of, you know, potentially doctor shopping and coming to you because they're, they think, oh, well, I didn't know optometrists could write for Vicodin in this state, so I'm going to hit hit this office and try to get, you know, a, a few pills. So there's a lot to consider here, but hydrocodone is a fine agent. It does it does a great job. And then last on the list here, as we move along and get towards some side effects and cases, don't forget tramadol. Tramadol was not a controlled substance until 2014. It was a, a big battle up until that point. It was a little surprising it wasn't a controlled substance because it does plug into mu receptors, not kappa and delta, but it does plug into mu receptors. So in 2014, two things happened. Vicodin went to a schedule two and tramadol went from not controlled to a schedule four controlled substance. Um, it is is a, a great choice for patients uh, who, you know, you might want a little bit of an opioid medication, but maybe not something even as much of a heavy hitter as even codeine or the hydrocodone. Um, it sort of is an immediate release product, but it also lasts for about eight hours. So it's kind of a good two for one. Also keep in mind that it does have a dual mechanism and it really does three things, but we call it a dual mechanism because one of them is this mu receptor agonist. And then the other part is neuronal transmission. It's inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin and norepi, which means that this drug increases serotonin, kind of one of our happy chemicals and norepinephrine in the brain. So it's that's a good thing. Problem with this is we can have some side effects that are difficult in a small number of patients. Tramadol is known to lower the seizure threshold, and it's also known to increase serotonin in patients, um, which can be problematic if a patient is taking high doses of other serotonergic agents like Prozac, um, like the triptans that people use for migraine headaches. It's when we start adding a lot of those serotonergic drugs together that we can have a problem. So you may not pick up on that you know, right away in a clinical scenario because you may not have all patients sometimes forget you know to, to add all their drugs to a list in other words they'll say I'm here to here to see my optometrist today I'm not going to tell them about my RA medications or my migraine medications or whatever because that's not relevant this is their thinking I'm not here for that today here I'm just you know coming to see the optometrist for this reason and patients fail to realize sometimes that everything is relevant to the optometrist when evaluating their medication. So we always have to say further, all right, I don't see anything listed um, that could be problematic with tramadol, but you know, just go through the list. Any Prozac type drugs or anything taking for migraine, and then you're in pretty safe waters. Yeah, and that was a that was a big deal. Um, you know, at least from a Pennsylvania standpoint, when we lost hydrocodone, you know, back in the day I used to use Darvaset. Darvaset was great for eye pain. Um, and then I think it was cardiac issues, Tracy, if I remember correctly, that it was then pulled off the market and not even used anymore. And then, um, you know, we talked about T3, uh, you know, codeine, but it just never really had a great affinity um, for eye pain. I would use it, but it just never really got that um, great analgesic effect. It was, that's all I could use, but tramadol was, was awesome for, uh, at 50 milligrams, you know, 50 milligrams, take one or two tablets. Again, you know, don't exceed, as it says on the slide there, four to six times a day. Or, um, I'm sorry, one or two tablets every four to six hours, but, you know, don't go over that 400 milligrams. But then I was always cautious on what to do with the patients that were taking uh, things like Prozac or the serotonin uptake. So really got quickly limited. So it was really nice because hydrocodone where i'm going with all this works really really well for for eye pain so 
you know, Lord tab is great, but you know, we used to use it. I had, I used to use Darvis set. Darvis set was awesome. Lost that. Okay. Had Hydra code down 2014. It goes to schedule two, lost that. All right. Back off to now Tramadol. Tramadol was great. And yeah, I'd make calls to, to the primary care docs. And, uh, you know, if they were on something like Prozac or, or migraine medication, like sumatriptan or something along that line, Imitrex. And since it was acute, they would, they would say, yeah, okay, just use it for a couple of days, but don't go beyond that too much. And we should be okay with the serotonin, but that still always made me a little, you know, cautious to do that. So it's kind of nice in a long drawn out way to have hydrocodone back in the mix for, for those people that are using like, uh, migraine medicines or things like Prozac that are the, those serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, and usually, uh, and usually when they have two together, like, I mean, you know, two thirds of the population, I think was the latest statistic is on some sort of antidepressant that might be a Prozac or a Zoloft or a Celexa or Lexapro, because we don't just use them for depression. We use them for anxiety. We use them for fibromyalgia. We use them for hot flashes, lots of different things. So usually if they're on one of those meds and they take tramadol, even chronically, that's not too much of an issue. It's when you add that third medication on board that it can be problematic. But I agree with Greg. If I had my choice and my druthers, I choose tramadol and most people as a recommendation over Tylenol number three or codeine because um, I think it gives better pain control and fewer side effects. And we'll go through some of that. Yeah, not that I codeine's just... a bad med, it's just different. Yeah. And I'll just echo one more time. I was on the slide there. And I think I said, as you can see, and I think Tracy mentioned it, this is like kind of the go-to medicine. So tramadol is there as kind of in an immediate release. And then you have the uh, extended release there, as you see tramadol extended release tabs, you know, for optometry standpoint, you know, make sure you just do all tram, which is the immediate release that, that one or two pills of 50 milligrams. And you'll do great when you have something like a corneal abrasion or laceration or something along that line. So 50 milligrams, one or two pills, all tram, just make sure it's not the extended release. Yeah, that never took off. That's sort of a lost leader, I guess. Oh, we got another poll. Yeah, we got a poll out there. Joe, can you? Yes, I'm, can... I, I, I'm going, I am on it. Great. Poll question number two. So when you see a patient in your office with methadone, be kind to them as they are trying to recover or have recovered from opioid abuse. So is that true or false? Every one that you see that comes in on methadone, you know, just be kind to them because, you know, they're recovering. So on and so forth. And look at that. Got these experienced poll takers that are out there. Back in March, we would do this. It would take uh, almost three hours to get up to 90%. Now it's just seconds here to get to the 90%. So, all right. So I think that's a good representation of our, where we want to go here. And I'm going to end the poll and I'll share the results. And uh, so the results here, uh, Tracy, I, I'm not sure if you can see them on your end, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it says true, be kind to them because, you know, they're recovering um, from the, uh, an opioid abuse. And then uh, we have about 40% here that say, you know, that's false. And I think you, you probably know where I'm going to go with this. Uh, and I'll let you take it from there once you see these, you know, now, now that you have these results. So. Yeah. And it's kind of a, a trick question. I always say, because there is a chance and there's, you know, a reasonable chance that they are somebody who has opioid use disorder. Um, you know, in an ideal scenario, somebody who has opioid use disorder goes on methadone uh, along with cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, and uh, Narcotics Anonymous, something like that. Um, and they're only on it for a short period of time. But there are a good number of recovering addicts that can't get off the methadone. And you kind of look at it and think, well, okay, I'd rather have them on methadone in perpetuity uh, at a very low dose if that's going to keep them clean. But on the flip side, we also do use methadone for chronic pain, and it's a great drug for chronic pain management. So we'll look at just quickly pharmacokinetically why that is. Uh, last couple things here, uh, just to kind of complete our list. Fentanyl, which is a pretty popular medication recreationally, unfortunately, but we also use it intravenously for uh, pain control in a patient, um, you know, during surgery and post-op as well. And it's very popular as a pain patch, and that's the Duragee 
analgesic. It is our most potent legal opioid. And we do not use duragesic patch in acute pain. You would think that that would be pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how uh, in years past, it was particularly popular in some dental circles for acute pain and patients died because you can't use meth uh, fentanyl, excuse me, if you um, are not used to having opioids in your body. It, it can kill a patient rather acutely. We also have meperidine, Demerol. If you are, you know, kind of my age or older, you know, in the 50-ish range, you may have heard of Demerol. We don't use it hardly ever. I can't tell you the last time I saw it. Um, the receptor drug complex is a little wonky and call this was Michael drug cocktail that finally finally killed him. And then we have methadone. So a uh, couple reasons that we also have, well, the main reason that these three drugs are listed on one slide is because we have to at least briefly mention, what if somebody's allergic to an opioid? So this is the point in time where I say, okay, usually if somebody comes in, they have four allergies that are going to be the most common on the list. We're going to look at one, but it's penicillin, codeine, uh, sulfa, and maybe aspirin. Those are, you know, kind of the top four allergies that are listed on a patient's profile. So a patient comes in and they're listed as having a codeine allergy. What does that mean to you as a practitioner? What can you prescribe? What, you, what can you not prescribe? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you don't even know they're listed as codeine allergic, in other words, they don't tell you that, but it's in the pharmacy system. If you give them tramadol as a prescription or Tylenol with codeine or Vicodin or morphine or, you know, a bunch of these that are not really within your scope of practice for writing, all of those will come up with a big red blinking screen that says patient has codeine allergy, do not prescribe this or it might kill them. Codeine is one of those things that, you know, when Greg and I were talking about, well, tramadol, we like a little bit more in certain scenarios than codeine. Codeine has the greatest affinity of most of the opioids for plugging into the chemoreceptor trigger zone by the brainstem. That's our barf center. So when we take codeine, even in low dose, a patient might get so nause nauseated and vomit from it. And then when you say, you know, any drug allergies, codeine, because in their mind, they had a reaction to it, which they did, but it wasn't an allergy. So the take home message from all of this is if we don't want to get into a scenario where patient ends up in the ER or comes to the farm, you know, outpatient pharmacy, and the only thing that they can get is fentanyl or meperidine or methadone because they're listed as a codeine allergic patient, and that wipes out all the other opioids except these three. We just have to ask the question, I see you're allergic to codeine, can you tell me what happens when you take codeine? Most of the time they're going to say, oh, it makes me so sick. I'm not suggesting we should say, oh, come on, suck it up, buttercup, it's just vomiting. Of course, we'll, you know, uh, take that into consideration as an intolerance, but it's not an allergy and it complicates things if we don't sort through that information, uh, you know, on the patient's behalf, most certainly. So if I get the big red blinking screen, uh, the days that I'm staffing, then I'm the one that is you know, I have to call you and we have to try to sort through it. I have to put my initials in to get to the next screen saying, I'm pretty sure it's not going to kill the patient. Well, a lot of times, you know, we're not comfortable doing that by ourselves. So we'll be calling you and saying, what's the deal? So here's methadone, just finishing up the last little tidbit of information, one little point that will help you try to assess patients if they come in on methadone. Methadone is used for chronic pain. Methadone is also used as a, um, uh, withdrawal symptom medication, mitigation drug. That was, uh, I, I flubbed that. But so somebody who has opioid use disorder, we're trying to keep them from going through withdrawal or having those symptoms of, I need more drug, I need more drug. Methadone is used for that. It's wonderful to mitigate symptoms of withdrawal. How do you tell if a patient comes in and you see methadone in their drug profile, how can you tell without asking them if they seem a little squirrely about it, whether they're likely taking it for pain or if they're likely taking it for opioid use disorder? Because, oh, by the way, if somebody is in a methadone treatment program or Suboxone, which we'll mention briefly here in a minute, you are not legally allowed to give them an opioid, tramadol, codeine, anything. You can't give them anything. So it's important to be able to kind of sort through where they stand on the methadone. So patient one in the middle here, the first scenario, the patient is on a short acting pain medication along with methadone. So I truncated this to make it 
pretty quick and I think I truncated it a little bit too much. So let's read that again. Patient is on a short acting pain medication along with methadone. So they might be taking uh, Dilaudid, they might be taking uh, generic fast acting oxycodone, Percocet and methadone. That means that they're likely using methadone for chronic pain and that is completely reasonable. A patient that would be typically using uh, methadone for opioid use disorder would be a patient who comes in, they aren't taking any other pain medications but only methadone and they're taking it at lower doses and usually just once per day. Uh, and then there's a good chance that they are taking it for opioid use disorder and you can flat out ask them. But again, if they're acting kind of a little uh, squirrely and you feel like maybe they have drug seeking activity again, it's just one little trick to kind of help sort through the information. And look at your PDMP, the you know, prescription drug monitoring program uh, that is free and it will tell you who's prescribing what, where they got it and how often they get it. I get so excited I skip ahead, but this is the codeine uh, allergy discussion as well. So just take the time as with every allergy to make sure it's documented appropriately so you can sort through the information and it helps the patient as well. What else do we have here, Greg? Oh, we've got a second video. Yeah, we got a video here kind of now showing how to uh, do the uh, do the assessing of pain and then really trying to now do the proper product selection. So we'll just kind of play the video. I think it will work here. No luck. Hello, no luck. Anyone? Is it playing, Greg? It is. Oh, sorry. I'll be quiet. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to pause this here, Trace, and I think people get the idea is that, you know, the whole idea is there's different scenarios there of getting traumas and assessing pain. And, you know, the whole idea is using those pain scales is to then start plugging it into, you know, the mild pain, as you referenced before, as being one to three, and then you have moderate pain being four to six. And then you can see here as you're moving in now with your you know, your non-steroidals and, uh, and your acetaminophens and then move, maybe moving into a low dose Altram and then going in th through the different pain scales. So do you want to walk through that? And uh, sure, sure and uh, that's the whole idea of a pain scale, right? That's the, the whole idea. And that little video was just kind of a cute video to kind of get all the different numbers. Um, just side comment. Apparently nobody can see the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't see it, so I just thought maybe it was on my end. Um, we alluded to this earlier with the pain scales, and you know, we said the one to three is the mild, four to six is moderate, and seven to nine or ten is uh, severe pain. And again, as Greg mentioned, this is a great quick list of medications that fit into the what's reasonable for mild pain, what's reasonable for moderate pain. And we also said earlier that there is a big difference between a one on the pain scale and even a three. They're both considered mild, but you know, a one, I don't know. I think once I hit 40, I, I had probably a one on the pain scale almost every day for some 
something. Um, so we're going to treat those differently. You'll also notice the trend between looking at this mild pain, you see tramadol there at the bottom, low dose, then you go to moderate pain. The first thing on the list is also tramadol. So we might just, you know, increase the uh, milligram amount that we're giving and even just give it more often in patients. So again, uh, fairly subjective, but it is nice to have kind of a more defined list of options for our patients. And then again, trying to stay away from from the, the real true a Schedule II uh, hydrocodone type product uh, or even a higher dose of Tylenol with codeine for patients who have more high-end moderate or really that severe pain. Poll question number three. Coming up. Trace, let me close out my thing here. I know that was me moving that. Okay, poll question number three once Joe gets it launched here is, one of the main problems with an opioid is, is what? Is it a low ceiling effect? Is it the high ceiling effect? Or is it the lack of a ceiling effect? So low, high, or no ceiling effect is the problem when it comes to opioids. Yeah, get people rolling in here. Joe, any questions rolling in? Apologize for the video not working, guys. Um, no, uh, uh, not a one, actually. Okay, perfect. So we just hit almost 90%. So to keep things moving along, I'll just end the poll and we'll share the results. And so, Trace, we got about a quarter of the uh, the audience saying low ceiling effect. We got about a quarter saying high and 50% saying lack of ceiling effect. So let me stop sharing it. Let me close it down. And then I'll let you take that over. So it's, it's, it's just a different way to say something that I said earlier, which is most of these opioids have no maximum daily dose. So they have uh, no ceiling effect, which means there's no upper limit on the actual amount that patients can take for both our opioids, save for tramadol and you know a couple of the others, uh, as well as our drugs of abuse like heroin. Of course, any of the opioids can be abused. So again, that is really problematic with potential for overdose and getting high. With our other agents, you know, we do have ceiling effects. Uh, in other words, you know, for most of them, we know that if we go above a certain maximum daily dose, even of I ibuprofen, we'll do that. Max daily dose of ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil is 3,200 milligrams per day. Um, not saying I haven't occasionally taken more than that, but uh, in general, the problem is we end up with more side effects than we do benefit from it. So the ceiling effect is not just efficacy, but it's also the toxicity. Yeah, so I guess a different way of saying that is, I think we, most of us know 800 milligrams ibuprofen, 800 times uh, uh, four is 3,200. You know, if, if you took a thousand, you're not gonna get like, or if you took uh, 1,600 at a time, you're not gonna get double the pain uh, coverage. You're just going to get that certain amount and it's not going to double. But the problem with an opioid is, is that your, you know, your body adjusts to it and then uh, you have to take more and more of it and you keep taking more and more, but then you have all those receptors that we talked about, those mu receptors in the, in the gut, which creates constipation, but then you have all those in the, in the lung, which then starts to uh, talk about what polling question number four is here. You know, what kills the patient when when taking too many opioids, you know, is it allergic reaction? Is it the constipation from, you know, and, and bowel rupture? Is it bleeding out because it's thinning the blood too much? Or is it the respiratory, you know, uh, the depression? And we'll just kind of wait for a few more people to make this interactive uh, to, to weigh in here. And then we will um, obviously see the answer as we share the results. Uh, and we kind of been alluding to it back and forth. So I'll just hit end. Oop, looks like it advanced the slide. But, uh, you know, what kills the patient is the respiratory depression, right? So I think the key that we want to point out is that these mu, kappa, and delta, more the mu and the kappa are all throughout the body, right? They're in our in, intestinal, in, intestinal tract. And when they become stimulated and tickled and 
have an opioid, the constipation occurs. And, you know, um, you know, obviously you get the euphoria, the dysphoria that Tracy was talking about, but as a patient is trying to get the pain coverage as they take more and more, it keeps slowing down, creating respiratory depression. And then that's what kills the patient, usually because they're taking it with other depressions, right, Trace? And you're usually able to rattle off, you know, the, uh, um, the, uh, the, those, um, those results or those different types of medications that cause, you know, respiratory depression along with that. Alcohol is one of the most, right. well, you know, dangerous. And then the benzos like Xanax, Valium, et cetera. So, so we got most people saying the respiratory depression. So that's, that's pretty good. And the problem in two is that, you know, I, I always say to a patient, all right, this says you're, you're able to take, you know, Vicodin one to two tablets every four to six hours as needed. That's a pretty wide range. Um, but I always say, you know, you can't go more than that because you're somebody who hasn't been on opioids ever or not in many, many years, like from a previous surgery. And you, you have to use scare tactics enough because they're true. And I say something like, understand when it says one to two every four hours, if you do two tablets every four hours, that's still fine. But you could be one extra tablet or tablet from overdose and and you did it innocently you were doing it because it wasn't taught you know causing pain uh to be diminished enough but it's it's a real problem um constipation everybody gets constipation uh from these agents except for maybe tramadol tramadol i would say it's kind of split but it's not a fait accompli like it is with all other opioids every single opioid tells the gut to stop moving as a matter of fact emodium loperamide, which you use if you have diarrhea, um, most common antidiarrheal that people take is a baby brother of the opioids because it works to stop gut peristalsis. So consider recommending patients take an over-the-counter, um, an over-the-counter combination. Oh, that's a good question about constipation too. I'll, I'll mention the answer to that. So recommending a combination of a stool softener plus a stimulant. And my favorite is the Senna S. It's dirt cheap. You can get 100 tablets, which of course you don't need that many, but for $2.60 and you'll be good, uh, good to go, literally and figuratively. Um, how long is too long for the constipation? Well, you know, if you have a patient who's coming in for some sort of optometric issue and you think, okay, they do need a pain medication, I'm going to give them enough for three days, you know, that, that has to be kind of practitioner's choice in the sense that they're, it's going to stop their gut for three days and it may be four days, maybe five until they move their bowels again, which to me is too long. I mean, you know, our bodies evacuate uh, toxins on a daily basis because that's what needs to happen. But if somebody doesn't move their bowels for a couple of days, maybe into three days, it's not going to be a medical emergency. It's just going to be uncomfortable for them. I don't know what happened there, Greg. That's um, good it's going to be uncomfortable for them. So in general, I think it's important always to tell patients, just so you know, uh, this is going to slow down your gut. You may not move your bowels for a couple of days and that's okay. Um, the worst scenario I ever saw was a, a student, actually a physician assistant student who ended up with muscle breakdown from running a marathon and she was in the hospital for 10 days and then she went home on pain meds and she finally texted me i think it was day 12 or 13 and said i still have not gone to the bathroom what do i do and i thought oh my gosh i mean you know she was post surgery it, it was a mess it was it took a long time to get her gut back moving that's how rough these drugs are on the gut. May not seem like a big deal, but it can be. The pruritus, um, these drugs can actually cause kind of an itching sensation. It's more common in IV opioids, but you do see people on oral opioids take getting this as well. And it's tough because you think, I just took this medication, now I'm itching, I might be allergic to it. It's actually unlikely that it is an allergy, but you always watch for rash or any other signs or symptoms of allergic reaction. Nausea, vomiting, this is that codeine allergy effect I was mentioning. Codeine plugs into our, our BARF center, that CTZ chemoreceptor trigger zone with more affinity than any of the other opioids. So patient may be unable to take codeine because it makes them BARF, but they can take oxycodone fine, hydrocodone fine, morphine, uh, tramadol, et cetera. Sedation, these will cause sedation across the board, except for maybe tramadol. Tramadol, again, um, 
it has no impact on me whatsoever. It does not make me tired, but I take any other opioid and it knocks me out. And that's true of most people. Many people will say, oh, I feel a little kind of jittery on tramadol um, more so than it would knock them out. But the sedation you do become tolerant to. So if you're somebody who is taking an opioid for chronic pain uh, or even abuse, you're not tired from it after the first week or so. It, it it no longer causes sedation. So some of these you become tolerant to. Constipation is not one of them. Um, let me see, Greg, you're gonna have to go forward. Yeah, you're gonna, you can request. Yeah, you know, what happens is sometimes the, the audience can draw on the screen. So I stopped the sharing and so on and so forth. So I'll give it back to you. So I just unshared and reshared. So that's what that was, that was what that was about. So um, there, there's the next uh, adverse drug effects. If you want to talk yeah, about perfect. this. Perfect. And just the last couple, some of these we've talked about, um, you know, inhibition of cough reflex, pretty odd that that's a side effect. Uh, but that's how we learned that codeine is a, is a wonderful cough suppressant. Confusion, euphoria, dysphoria, um, meiosis. Some, some pupils become slightly tolerant to the meiosis, but uh, not completely. So people who take, you know, higher doses of OxyContin on a daily basis, basis for chronic pain, uh, malignant or, or other, um, will have, you know, more um, meiosis in terms of the size of their pupils, but they may not always be pinpoint pupils. So you can make it some tolerance to that. But that respiratory depression, this is what kills a patient. It might be just a slightly higher dose uh, or hit of what they're used to. It could be mixed with something um, you know, heroin mixed with fentanyl, that's always a horrific drug combo on the street. Um, or it could be that the patient decides, you know, hey, I'm feeling pretty good. I know I took my Oxycontin at two o'clock, but I'm having a good day. And they go and they have a couple of alcoholic beverages thinking, oh, it's only a half a glass of wine. I'm only having two of them. That might be just the combination to kill them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is scary. It is scary. And this is what ends up with uh, people inadvertently dying from combinations of meds. All right, let's see, round out the last few things here. Withdrawal symptoms, I'm going to kind of roll this together with tolerance, uh, etc. So we can get to the cases and we should be fine on time here. But everybody who takes opioids more than just a couple of weeks will have slight withdrawal symptoms. It's just a normal physiologic effect to the drug plugging into the receptors. So in other words, let's say you have a patient who has chronic pain, they're taking opioids, um, you know, chronically, but sometimes their dose changes. So maybe there's some type of pain chronically that is really bad for one week. So they're taking more of the maximum dose that they've been told they can take per the directions. And then a few days later, they're like, oh, I'm feeling better. So they back way down on their opioid dose. There's a good chance that they'll go through some sort of withdrawal. It is a normal physiologic process to both um, changing doses of opioids, which may be appropriate, or abuse. And the uh, it, it can be pretty uncomfortable. But people don't die from opioid withdrawal. It You might feel like you want to die, particularly if you're a heroin addict or, or you're an opioid opio uh, oxycontin chewer uh, but it's not going to kill you with that um I already mentioned this mixing or opioids with other CNS depressants. So that's quite a quite a list. But with this entire scenario of withdrawal, et cetera, we have to look at the drugs that are quickly available for um, antagonism of our opioids, and then just a basic definition of tolerance. So these are our opioid antagonists. If you look at the left, that's morphine structure. You look at the right, that is naloxone's structure, which is Narcan. So Narcan, naloxone, Naloxone is the most well-known opioid antagonist, um, and the beauty of it is, look at that structure. The, it works because it looks so similar to morphine that and other opioids that when a patient intentionally or unintentionally takes too high of a dose of morphine or fentanyl or heroin or any opioid agonist, they can get nasal spray, IV, or even kind of almost like an EpiPen, but it's Narcan dose of uh, this antagonist that if it's enough of the Narcan getting into their system quickly, it can reverse the opioid agonist respiratory depression. The problem is you have to be fast. 
if you've ever had any type of procedure like a colonoscopy or having, you know, major dental surgery where you're like, hey, how you doing? You know, what about those Tampa Bay Buccaneers? And then you're out like a light. And they literally just said to you, well, I'm going to start giving you your pain meds. And before you know it, you're out like a light. The respiratory depression can happen that fast as well. So it's a scary proposition. Sometimes one dose of Narcan isn't enough. So, so Tracy, um, so, so to kind of make to what's happening here, we keep hammering those, those mu and kappa receptors. So the, those receptors that are in the lung, they're, they're being, uh, they're being suppressed by the, by the opioid. And then it just has a higher affinity and it just knocks it off and allows the patient to breathe again. Is that kind of the, yeah, the kind it's of kinda, the, it basically is, you know, sometimes it's squatters rights, you know, so basically a drug will be like, no, I was here first. So move along there, sir. You know, the one that came second, but in this particular case, it's literally, you know, the one that came second, which was the Narcan goes in and, uh, you know, is asking the, the drug or basically just budging it out of the way. The receptor drug complex is so similar between the agonist and the antagonist that since the antagonist came second, it's gonna go in and kind of nudge, hopefully enough of the opioid out of receptors that um, it's actually a CNS mediated respiratory depression, but that it'll, a patient will just <gasps> start breathing again. Um, but sometimes the dose is so high that the patient has taken that you don't have enough Narcan to actually get them to breathe again. And you, it's not unheard of at all for a patient to uh, have their life saved in the emergency room, then leave against medical advice. 15 minutes later, they get another hit of heroin, which the heroin then is after the antagonist. So now the heroin is going to go in and tell Narcan, get out of those receptors, um, the latest on the scene, and then they'll, they'll die from an overdose again. It's wow. crazy, sad as well. So we've been able to use this this drug agonist antagonist um, theory and, and really turn it into something that is life-saving as well as life-changing. If you've ever heard of Suboxone, it's kind of uh, a third of the way or 40% of the way down on the slide, buprenorphine plus naloxone is brand name Suboxone. It's a combination of buprenorphine, which is an opioid agonist antagonist in one drug, it has both properties, mixed with a pure antagonist, naloxone. So you do hear of Suboxone treatment programs and methadone treatment programs. Sometimes patients do well on one, not on the other. So they're, they're both equally important for, for patients. Um, you can abuse both methadone and Suboxone. So if somebody has the will to get high, it, it'll, it'll happen. Tolerance literally just means, and it's important definition because it's part of the curriculum, and it's important for patients to understand that it doesn't mean that you're a, a drug addict. Tolerance literally means increase in dose to maintain effect. So you can see here, that would mean increase in dose to maintain analgesic potential pain control for a patient who has true pain, but it also could mean for the drug abuser, increase in dose to maintain getting high. And it is sometimes a very fine line in patients, uh, but it is a normal physiologic process. Greg was talking about this a minute ago, uh, you know, with receptors and, you know, kind of leading up to the tolerance here. And I got to thinking, it's such an interesting pharmacologic principle that you know, even with sympathetic medications, sometimes they quit working after a while. And it's not really that uh, the receptors are just getting lazy. It's almost a protective mechanism for the body. You know, the body's never happy to have drugs in there. Even Narcan that's saving a patient's life, the body's never like, yay, Narcan's here. It's like, oh crap, another drug I have to deal with. So that receptor tolerance issue, we think part of the uh, problem is that the drug, the body gets so sick of having drug plugged into these multitude of receptors all the time that it sort of down regulates their ability to have an effect it's such an interesting pharmacologic principle which you know we don't fully understand so tolerance is normal patients that have cancer pain uh, that may be a prolonged illness uh, it's going to happen to them they're going to need higher doses of these medications to have proper pain control so it's a, it's a tough thing to discuss with patients. But true addiction is compulsive use despite harm. So if you've ever seen one of those horrible episodes of um, intervention, 
on TV, it's been going on for years, you know, those drug addicts, essentially, whether they're alcohol abuse, heroin, crystal meth, whatever the case may be, they've reached a point where they are literally just doing it enough to not go through withdrawal. They're not even getting that euphoria from it in many cases anymore. It's just that compulsive use to just, you know, not go through these crazy withdrawal syndromes uh, that we see. The drugs uh, or substances are not improving life at all. They just are now completely hooked on the medication. So some of this is what we've already said, but you know, if somebody does have a substance abuse history, it's important to uh, you know consider not using an opioid in somebody who's who will say to you, "Hey, just so you know, I'm a recovering addict, or I don't take anything anymore, but I was a Vicodin addict." Um, you know, we're not going to really want to give them medications that can trigger those uh, those characteristics, those chemicals in the brain, as well as those um, those needs. You know, it, it can trigger a behavior. Ways to respond: I always say, you know, you're the one in the in the driver's seat. You get really good at picking up on who you think is playing you. Um, and usually, if your red flag and your brain is going up, there might be something wonky going on. So you have tools at your disposal. You can call the local pharmacist, you know, based upon where a patient gets their medications uh, filled. But also, that prescription drug monitoring program is vital. Vital. You can register for free, and you can look patients up uh, to see who's prescribing what, even if it doesn't go through insurance. It shows all the different practitioners that are prescribing as well. Greg, anything you want to mention here with the alternatives before we before you roll into the cases? Yeah, I'll kind of just run through here, and then I'll let you kind of fill in the gaps. We started about uh, an hour and f uh, 39 minutes ago, so I'll just kind of get it wrapped up here and uh, <clears throat> let you fill in the gaps of of, of of what I leave out. So, you know, when we do these programs, we got to have alternatives to talk about. And so, you know, we keep talking about opioids, and we already talked about a lot of the COX-2, uh, the NSAIDs, we didn't really talk COX-2 inhibitors, but we talked cortical steroids. You know, don't forget about acupuncture and nerve blocks and, and, and spinal cord uh, stimulators that are out there for as, as alternatives. But when it comes to treating the eye, you know, there is, you know, using of a bandage contact lens for, for this, and there's actually a CPT code for it. So don't forget that, you know, you can maybe avoid using someone that needs a, a narcotic by, uh, by using uh, a bandage contact lens, and Tracy has spoken to the to the uh, cortical steroids here uh, a little bit earlier, and uh, there's methyl uh, prednisolone, and uh, I think there's another one here, Trace, that you talk about this uh, milli pred uh, dose pack. So, what do you always kind of like to differentiate between these two? Do you have a comment on that? Very quick comment, which is if you need a steroid dose pack, that is the self tapering, which we all know is medral dose pack, just use that. It's dirt cheap, it's pennies as compared to this millipred one that has come out uh, on the next slide that is prednisolone. It is not better, it is just more expensive by a crazy amount of money. So don't fall into the trap when you see, oh, new shiny drug. We don't need it. So, you know, so there are some adverse events, you know, the steroids out there that, uh, that we always like to point out when you're doing it. And don't forget the alternative uh, is, is, is Tylenol or is, when you see it on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a prescription bottle, it's listed as APAP. Um, just be remember that alcohol is cleared through the liver and so is Tylenol. Uh, so, you know, just be careful when they, you know, if someone's drinking that you're not giving them Tylenol with it. And I think we're all pretty familiar with Advil and Motrin. And we have a slide here that, that was part of an article that uh, Tracy and I wrote, and this is just a clip from it. And one of the famous ways that I like treating uh, you know, uh, eye pain is I call it two and two or four and two. And I think that's, uh, that's what this is referencing right here is that you just need to know your kind of your upper limits. Remember, there's no ceiling effect, but these are just kind of what I've found in the literature. But when it comes to ibuprofen, remember 800 milligrams four times a day or 300 milligrams. So if you're just trying to treat pain, you can do two and two. You can do two Advil and two Tylenol uh, for the patient, like two, two, two uh, 500 milligrams of, of, of Tylenol, that's 1,000, two, uh, 200, which is 400 at a time, four pills, take it, 
and you'll get some really good pain and it gets to the threshold of morphine. It just doesn't stay up there for long periods of time. But if you have something that's inflammatory, you can give them four pills of the ibuprofen. So you're getting the anti-inflammatory, then the analgesic, and then obviously the Tylenol just does the analgesic side. So you can do four and two and two and two with a bandage contact lens. These are just all alternatives that are out there for, for the pain. So, you know, our associations have fought hard. Uh, that's the reason why we take this course uh, that's out there and a, and a good reason to have a DEA uh, number. So let me just show you some really quick cases here, um, you know, where we've, where we've used or I've used uh, uh, opioids in the practice, large corneal abrasions, ocular trauma, blowout fractures, and scleritis. You know, here's a patient that uh, decided to barbecue her cornea with a curling iron, nice big S char there, some well done epithelium, nice turning, nice and white, um, depending on the threshold and the pain scale, they might need it. Tracy referenced this one. This patient came in tons of pain. I'm like, oh man, they just want to have, um, they just want some narcotics. You know, how can they be in this much pain? Right here is where you can see where this person was using like a, uh, like a, um, a very sharp uh, razor blade and they cut their cornea. And whenever I'm like, well, it can't be that bad, but I took the OCT and you can see that they uh, almost went the whole way through. They went two thirds of the way through their cornea. And we all know how many corneal nerves there are. Now it makes sense how, why this patient was in so much pain. They gave themselves their own little self-induced RK incision. Um, but they only needed some tramadol uh, to kind of get them through this for a day or two until we got them healed up. This was a patient that uh, was taking off uh, some rusty brakes uh, right after the winter time in the Altoona area and uh, was using the uh, screwdriver and trying to pry off this brake and boom, the screwdriver came up through. Not They gave himself kind of a little LASIK flap here, went about 50% through, I used my OCT, but they also had a nice little big laceration up in their upper orbit area in the conjunctiva. And you can see the pupil and you can see down here a nice little hyphema. So obviously we cycloplegied the patient, got him on some steroids, and then we used uh, some opioid uh, that we, you know, all tram or, you know, hydrocodone, something along that line for, for this patient. This was a gentleman that went for a DSEC procedure, decided follow-ups weren't needed, and then he came in with this huge pain. And by the time we were able to get him off at least you know, to the corneal specialist the next day, we just gave him some, some narcotics and, you know, something like a lower tab just to, so they could, he could get a good night's sleep. You know, I would probably would have avoided all tram in this case, just for the fact that, you know, this person is going to have a tough time sleeping with this much eye pain. So maybe something like a, a lower tab to help uh, get them to sleep at night. So those are just some cases that are out there. We don't have to launch this poll, Joe, but I just want to kind of, you know, despite not needing opioids, uh, that are off that we're not using in the optometric care is it's still important to carry a DEA number, you know, true or false. I kind of like to see where the colleagues stand on this. And, you know, I believe, you know, with all the f battles that go on and like Joe said, I do a lot of um, still at the POA level, we just passed a bill last year and we're always being constantly thrown under the bus by, you know, some of our uh, medicine friends and trying to expand our scope and, you know, that just, so they'll use, oh, look at optometry using opioids and abusing them. That's like one argument that could be used. And that gives an optometrist a reason like, oh, I'm not going to have a DEA number just for that reason. But, you know, it's, it's in this crisis and we don't, we're not a part of it. It shows how responsible we are. So I would encourage everyone out there. Um, most of you are on here taking it because you have a DEA numbers, but encourage our colleagues to to continue with that DEA number to really keep advancing the profession of optometry. And with that being said, Joe, we're at the question part. Um, are there any questions that need to be addressed? I'm going to look right now. And the answer is no. Last question, uh, the last question that came in, Tracy Handel about how long is too long for constipation. So I think we're all good on that. Perfect. So, um, Tracy, I went through that. Any final comments before I thank the audience here? No, sir. Okay. So thanks everyone for, for attending the course tonight, the treatment of pain, opioid choices and, uh, and issues for the patient and practitioner. 
it certainly was a pleasure. I always love, I love co-lecturing. I love lecturing with my partner, Joe. And, and obviously Tracy and I have been doing this for quite a long time. Tracy, it's always nice to share the dance floor with you. So in the podium, so in this case, a microphone. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me.